All right, today's notes are in our genetics uh, chapter three. We're going to look at section one, which is genes today. First thing we need to do is go over some vocabulary. This image here in the middle is a chromosome. Remember that eukaryotic chromosomes are made of DNA and protein. Prokaryotic chromosomes are, have no protein associated with them. They are considered naked. But all chromosomes contain genes, which are the heritable factors that control specific characteristics of the organism. And then there are alleles, which are different forms of a specific gene on a chromosome. Each gene has its own locus or location on a gene. This is this dark band is a particular gene's location. So it's a specific position of a gene on a chromosome. Remember that all individuals of a species have the same genes. They have those genes on the same locations of the same chromosomes. So we consider those chromosomes within the species to be homologous chromosomes. This website here is a fantastic uh, tour help. It is from a place called Learn Genetics. Um, Learn Genetics has a lot of great information. It's a basic tour of what is a gene, um, simple animation. If you'd like to review this, um, as you can see there's a few things uh, that it'll take you through. We are going to close that. When you compare the number of genes, each organism has a different number of chromosomes and then even then a different number of genes within the chromosome. So first our prokaryotes are our most simple organism. For example, our E. coli, remember that prokaryotes only have one chromosome, one single circular naked chromosome. And But this E. coli has 3,200 genes within that chromosome. We can look at a different, even when you have two different plants, like I have the rice and the beans here, the Salus lunatus and Orza savata. They um, differ by just two different chromosomes, but you can see the number of genes within these two organisms is vastly different, um, even though they only have two chromosomes different. Um, and even then, this little rice with 24 chromosomes has less chromosomes than we humans at 46, but way more genes. Um, we only have about 23 thousand genes as opposed to this 41,000. So um, all organisms have a different number of chromosomes and a different number of genes within those chromosomes. We've talked about a gene locus is the specific location where um, the position on the chromosome where it's located, but how do we get that locus? Well, there's a system for assigning a name to the location. We're looking here um, at a specific gene, TP53, which is going to prevent tumors, and we're found at this location. But what in the world does this mean? Well, we have chromosomes. Each have a number. So remember that we have 46 chromosomes in our body, but they are arranged in 23 pairs. So this gene is found on chromosome 17. That's what that first 17 here means. Then also you have your centromere. If you remember back um, to our cell division, each chromosome is has a centromere. The, above the centromere, this is called the P region, and below the centromere is called the Q region. So that letter is going to tell you whether you're looking at the top or the bottom of the chromosome, and then the rest of the number, this 13.1, tells you where within that section. So 13.1 should be about right here um, in between the 6.5 and 15.5, and you can see here is the TP53, which is located on chromosome 17 in the P section at 17, 13.1, uh, excuse me. All right, let's see if you can try some on your own. We have um, A, B, and D here labeled. See if you can match the three gene loci here with their letters. Remember, the first number is the chromosome number. Then the letter has to do with whether it's the top or the bottom. And then the last number, um, the three digits, has to do with where it's located on the chromosome. All right, so hopefully you were able to get that chromosome 11P13.1 was here at A. The 11 is on, indicates that it's on chromosome 11. That 
the 16Q13.2 was B here on chromosome 16, and the 17Q1.1 was uh, D, which was on chromosome 17. All right, uh, continuing on with our genes discussion, we have our famous scientist, Gregor Mendel. Uh, Gregor was the fa or is considered the father of genetics. He's an Austrian monk, a teacher, and a gardener. And he worked with garden peas. These are some of the peas that he studied. He looked at different traits, such as tall plants versus short plants. He looked at whether the seed pods were plump versus wrinkled, whether the peas within the pod were round or wrinkled, whether they were green or yellow, whether the pod color was green or yellow, and then finally the flower, whether it was white or purple. And he came up with this idea of alleles, and this is one specific form of a gene and that form differs from other alleles by one or a few bases only and occupies the same gene locus or location as other alleles for the same gene so the alleles for whether the flowers are white or purple would be found at the same uh, specific location within the chromosome, but they would have two different sequences of bases. So um, just like we were just were talking about alleles, we have tallness and shortness of our plant. All right. So examples of alleles, you could have two alleles, such as our plant that is tall versus our plant that is short. Sometimes we refer to the alleles um, as letters, big T, little t, you might remember that from our, your baby bio days. But we can also have more than two alleles for the, a trait. So, for example, human blood type has three alleles, and that gives us four different um, what we call phenotypes. So uh, these alleles have superscripts, the A and the B, to help us um, identify the difference between the capital letters. All right, we also have this idea of a single nucleotide polymorphism. This is called an SNPS. It's pronounced a SNP. So remember that a gene is a length of DNA, and the sequence of the DNA within that gene could be hundreds or thousands of bases long. Different alleles for a gene will have differences in the sequence of their bases. The differences in the bases for the different alleles is usually only one letter or a very small number of letters. So, so here you have two alleles, two sections of DNA here, one, two, um, and those alleles have small differences. You can see the changes here. Instead of a GC and one allele, there's an AT combination, and then down here there are two other changes. So there's a very small number of differences in the sequence of bases, and this is called a SNP. Mutations. So sometimes we have random changes in allele formation. Mutations, there's no particular mechanism or process. There's no reason necessarily for a particular mutation. The most significant type of mutation is a base substitution where one nitrogen base is substituted for another. Almost all mutations are considered neutral or harmful, very few are actually beneficial um, over the term of the evolution of the species. Um, very few mutations will actually lead to a beneficial change in the long run that helps the species. There are some, but most of our mutations are considered neutral where there is no side effects or they are harmful. Mutations in general can be eliminated when the organism dies if the mutation is found in a body cell, such as a skin cell or a blood cell. If the mutation is found in a gamete, an egg or a sperm, then that mutation could be passed on to the offspring, which is another reason why those mutations are very rarely beneficial. It would have to be in the gamete and then passed on to the offspring. All right, one um, particular disease that's caused by a single base substitution mutation is the sickle cell uh, disease for red blood cells. So it is um, from a single base substitution mutation. It occurs on chromosome number 11 at 11P15 point B. It is the HBB gene. The normal sequence, we just have a, a snippet of the sequence here, is CCT, GAG, GAG. 
when that is transcribed into the mRNA and then translated into the amino acid sequence, we get proline, glutamic acid, and then glutamic acid, which gives us our normal hemoglobin shape. When we have a mutant, that A in the first GAG is substituted for a T. So when that gets translated and transcribed and translated, we now get proline valine, proline valine, and glutamic acid. That one amino acid change from the one base substituted, nitrogen base that's substituted, gives us a sickle shape in our hemoglobin. And if we look at glutamic acid versus valine in the structure of the amino acids, you'll see, remember that your basic amino acid um, chemical composition is the same. It's just our side chains that are different. And if you look here, I'm just going to give you a little hint that the glutamic acid has a polar area, whereas valine has a non-polar area. So that is going to allow the conformational change and folding within the protein for hemoglobin to be different. So instead of folding up like this, we get this sickle shape of the hemoglobin, which makes the red blood cells form this sickle shape as well. All right, so going on to genomes, continuing with our vocabulary as we're laying the foundation for the rest of our unit. The whole of the genetic information is can, of an organism is considered a genome. In animals, this is all the chromosomes in the nucleus plus the DNA in the mitochondria. In plants, it's all the chromosomes in the nucleus, the DNA in the mitochondria, and also the DNA in the chloroplast. In prokaryotes, it's just the DNA in the circular chromosome, but sometimes prokaryotic, prokaryotic cells have plasmids. So any DNA that's in the plasmids would also be considered part of the genome. We began a human genome project in 1990 where we started to sequence the human genome. The first draft was published in 2000 and this complete sequence was published in 2003. Interesting piece of information, though, this sequence, this genome that was published for the Human Genome Project in 2003, this was only one person's set of chromosomes. It was not, it was a human genome, not the human genome. So we do not have, we are still studying all the different alleles um, that we can find within the human genome. We just now know which genes are located where, not necessarily all the alleles that could be. We were able to discover a lot of information through the Human Genome Project, not just um, the sequence of the genes. But we also discovered that not all of the genome is actually transcribed into proteins. And we first called that information junk DNA. We didn't know what that was for, didn't seem to have a purpose. Upon further study, since we have been able to complete the sequence and continued with the Human Genome Project, we've actually found out that that's satellite DNA, or what we are now referring to as satellite DNA. Although it's not made into proteins, it does help regulate which sections of the genes are turned on and off for protein making at different times.